All right, so welcome to the last talk, I think, before lunch about CRDs. Everything, is, I guess, was about CRDs. Those who have seen Joe before, it was about CRDs. This as well. I'm Stefan Szymanski. I'm one of the uh, initial authors heavily involved in CRDs. So lots of the things you see today, defaulting, structural schemas, blame me for that. Um, I was all in there. Um, today we want to talk about something which is CRD-based, but could be a next step for the ecosystem to use them. So this is how it started. Um, a few weeks ago, I realized that. So it's so hard still to get something like a MySQL claim API into my cluster. There are so many providers providing MySQL, but if I want to have one, I have to go to some websites or some cloud provider UI to create databases. It's still not native, right? I cannot say kubectl create MySQL without installing anything into my cluster. So what I want to have, and that's a submission, that's basically the, the dream where we want to go to as an um, ecosystem, I don't want operators to do that. Like, I want to consume a MySQL from anybody who offers it in some service. I want to have it native, CRD-based in my Kubernetes, but I don't want to run anything. I don't want to run an operator just to get a software as a service MySQL. And for eight years, we have built systems like operators, not for eight years, but in Kubernetes, basically, we don't support software as a service. This is basically the rent here. This started as a, as a Twitter tweet, um, very ad hoc at the time, and many people answered. I guess some of them are here. There is no SaaS support in Kubernetes, while the whole ecosystem around us builds software as a service. So can we change that? And six years we have spent in building operators, and I'm focusing here on operators which don't operate, like operators which don't run local pods. This last class is totally, um, it's a good use case. Like if you run pods and you want to run your on-premise in your cluster database, that's fine. But if it's a software as a service, I don't want operators. I think we as an ecosystem do something which is not really helpful. Basically, it creates so much complexity when I have to maintain operators for software as a service. Basically, we, 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 have building, or we, we are building that, right? Everybody knows those pictures. Many adapters between different worlds, different standards, different um, um, API um, variants. And, but we are in Kube here, so we are in KubeCon, and we love Kube APIs, so we need something else. And that was basically the result of this Twitter um, rant. We need to build something which gives us software as a service natively in Kube. That's the topic of today. So, the future. Let's imagine I want a database. So I chose not MySQL here, I chose MongoDB and trademarks and everything, so MongoDB for today. We want mangoes, mangodbs. So what if we had this command in kubectl, kubectl bind against a URL? And mangodb.com, that's this big mangodb service provider, he implements, they implement this protocol, whatever it is in the background. Imagine this exists. What happens? Um, I'm redirected to my browser by that. I'm a developer, so I want a super easy experience. I'm a GitHub, so I click on authentication at GitHub. I say, yes, MongoDB should see my, my identity. So let's click. I'm here. I want the MongoDB CRD, basically. The resource which can claim a MongoDB from a service provider. Imagine there could be more. I mean, there are some companies who have hundreds of different types of objects. MongoDB is really single focus. They just have MongoDB. I bind to it. I click on bind. I'm asked um, about additional um, permissions. So MongoDB wants to create one secret where they put a token to, to connect to the database. And they want to create a, a service in my cluster where I can connect to, to connect to the endpoint of the MongoDB. And I say, yes, they can do it. And we are here. So we have a CID in the system. My Kubernetes knows about MongoDBs. Nothing installed. One command, few clicks, done. There's no MongoDB claim, so get MongoDB is empty. But I have one here, so for my pod MongoDB database, very simple, nice API. I apply that. I check, there's nothing running here, so just the infrastructure stuff you have in your, in your cluster. 
there's no MongoDB pod because the service operator, the service provider runs that for me. A few seconds later, it's running. There's something provided by the, by the provider and I'm connected. I can look into it. There's a status, everything we know from normal native CRDs. It's running, type ready is to, looks great. I have my service, so I gave the permission to create a, serv a service, just this service, nothing else. It's there, I can connect my application to it. I can check there's an API binding, so kubectl bind creates a binding. There's a URL, it's connected, H is 11 minutes. There's a heartbeat between my cluster and the provider, so everybody, both sides basically, knows the status of the connection. That's it, that's the future. Super simple extension mechanism for Cube. I don't want operators for that. We can do better. So to look a bit into details, what have we seen? API is consumed in the Cube cluster without, without running anything in that cluster. We have seen more. We have seen API bindings. I checked the API binding, the status of that, and this is a sketch of the API. This will become much more concrete in a later point in the talk. Here it's just a sketch, a binding on my side and an export on the provider side. On the right side, you have the provider persona, service provider, the database provider, MongoDB as a company. They export the API and I can bind to it. So I just say the URL is that one. I want those resources. You remember the selection of the binding. So the resource I want, MongoDB in that case. And there's a binding. Security. I don't want to give anybody access to my cluster. I think we share this usually that service providers shouldn't talk to my API server. So in this case, what I want, the service provider needs ways to see the binding, that's the first thing. Maybe access some more things like token secrets and service. But if there's other stuff in my cluster, like other service accounts, deployments, config maps, anything which is not connected to MongoDB, the service provider should not even see and, of course, not access. There's more than that. Everybody knows those screens, like on the mobile, applications can ask for permissions. So they can ask, um, can I read your GPS position? Can I read your contacts, whatever. Everybody knows that. And similar things for OAuth-based um, authentication. So if you, you have seen that earlier on the screen, so I gave the permission to see my identity to MongoDB. Similar thing. And a similar thing we could imagine in this model. Like a service provider could claim access, claim access to the MongoDB object. This is pretty natural, right? That is nothing special I would have to agree with. If I bind to MongoDB, of course, service provider should see my MongoDB objects. But we also saw services and secrets, but very, very slimmed down, like we did a minimal set of access. And we call that permission claim, this pattern. Could be something in such a model where you can claim access beyond the actual resource you're exporting. There are more uh, variants of that. Who has that in the basement? I guess many people know that, right? Fuses in the basement. There is this thing, um, you cannot access it. I mean, technically you can. You can open the anti-temper seal with any kind of tool and access it. But next time the electrician comes into your house, they won't be happy, right? So similar thing, um, we could protect access to certain things. One example here is um, there's a MongoDB object. It has a status, right? The user should not touch status. I mean, if it does, it's your etcd, so you can do it technically. But we can do measures, implement measures, like admission, for example, which just stops that. I mean, in the usual case. Again, it's like an anti-temper seal. You can open it. But there's a reconciler, and the, the service provider will see what you have done. So there are consequences for the contract with your service provider. There are more things. You could place objects into the cluster, which um, the user maybe shouldn't be able to update, like a resource quota. Again, it's not super high security, it's more like to prevent bad user experience. If I only have um, permission to create five MongoDBs at the provider level, a resource quota locally with the number five as maximum makes sense, right? So you get a natural cube native message, oh, this cannot be created because quota. Those things can be built in this model. 
So what we have seen, and there are of course more patterns, more ideas, and you can be creative um, to, to think about that. We have seen exports and bindings. We have seen permission claims. We have seen those inverse things which act like this anti-temper seal. So think about it, the rent from, from August it was, I think. There is no SARS in Kubernetes, but we can build it, right? This future is feasible. This was August 17th, and well, we took this uh, serious and just sat down and built it, right? So there's Qbind. It's a project in GitHub. Go to it. It implements the binding. It implements a connector, which does a connection between your cluster and the other side. There are no permission claims yet, so everything you saw about permission claims and inverse permission claims, it's not there. We know how to build it because we have done similar things in KCP, so we, we have explored this domain, so we have ideas how this could look like as an API. But this is the next step. Qbind for pure resources exists today. And I will showcase it uh, in a second, and after the talk, you will have a chance to do it yourself. All right. So it's Qbind, GitHub Qbind, Qbind. Um, if you go to the, uh, to the repository, you find those three comp components, basically. There's a QCuttle bind um, plugin. There is a vendor neutral component which does all the logic. So, oops. No, it's hard. <laughs> so there's a connector which is a vendor neutral agent on the cluster, but super minimal. It just syncs the objects back and forth. And there's an example backend implemented. You can run this example backend on any cube cluster. It uses namespace isolation for tenants, so you can con connect m many clusters and many namespaces in those clusters and create MongoDBs, for example. Very important, this is an example. There's a protocol mostly based around, uh, yeah, based on APIs, so you can look at the APIs and you will see what the protocol actually is. Lots of the back end is example code. Like everything about authentication and authorization is just an example. If you want to integrate that with your service provider codes, architecture, whatever you have already, like if you are MongoDB and you have something like authorization and you have user databases and everything, there's no need to replace that. Just take this example back end, adapt it to your needs, support the protocol, that's it. That's a kubectl plugin, so it's bind. There are essentially two parts to that. The first one is basically what we have seen here. So you pass a URL. This is nice for the developer workflow, right? Everything is done via, via click in the browser. Very easy. But eventually you want to use it in production in some sense. So you want to use it, for example, in Argo CD, in GitOps tools, whatever. And there's a second part, basically, when you call the first command, the second part is implicit, but you can call it um, explicitly. So you can basically run the bind as, uh, as a buff, but as a dry run mode, and output the YAML, it gives you a request object. And you can then take this request object, persist it, it has everything describing what you want to bind, bind to, and then um, yeah, use that as a basis for automation, for example. And it looks like that, so again, the components I just showed. Kubectl bind is here. The connector is running on your cluster, here on the left. And the backend, backend is running here. It's basically a set of controllers operating on those API objects here. And it uses normal cube namespace isolation. So it's a dotted line because obviously um, those are namespaces, right? Everybody here in the room knows what namespaces can do, what they can't do. And you can run any kind of operator to do the work on those objects. And I will show in a second how to use the MongoDB community operator just as it is offered in GitHub and just build a service. We will see that in a second. Okay, so let's build MongoDB in real. In August, it was all a rent, nothing else, but we can do it in real. So I found that, MongoDB. Let's implement MongoDB in, yeah, by using a MongoDB operator. So that's a repository. I installed this thing in my cluster. And I found out that's pretty hard to use, actually. There's an API, obviously, to create MongoDB community objects. They define, basically, databases. They're namespaced. 
And the first thing I realized, oh, you have to create those other seven objects manually here on the right side. So there are two service accounts, two roles, two role bindings. And I don't want to give this to users, right? That's far too complicated. I don't want that. It must be simpler. That's a term I like to use here. This mess which we just have seen on the slide, it does not matter if it's in a warehouse, right? Warehouses are ugly, but they are super optimized. So let's try to do warehouse-style computing in Cube for software as a service. So messy things, you have to maintain them, but the customer will never see the mess. Pretty cool um, change to the operator model we have seen, I think. So this is what I want to show my users. I want to have this, uh, this API um, replica count, so it's HA or it's not HA, and maybe a version. That's it. And I want to map that to MongoDB community. So cross-plane to a rescue, I thought, preparing this talk, I wanted to show MongoDB directly, tricky, ugly. So cross-plane can do this um, templating of those, I mean, of the main object plus those seven objects I also need, right? That's what I did. So I, I want to use cross-plane to make that simple. Okay, that's the architecture. And here you see the power of community. Cross-plane is a community project. I use it as is. We have built Kubebind, and both of them together give you a service. You as an IT provider in the company, for example, you can build that, right? There's no line of code. It's all defined by a cube, cube, cube resources. So what, we, what do we see? At the top in green, you see everything about Kubebind. So here's a binding, here's the export, and it, it exports in a CRD. So there's a MongoDB CRD reflecting basically or implementing, specifying the schema or the example um, API we have just seen, that one. That's a MongoDB CRD, and Crossplane adds some stuff for templating. Think of Crossplane just as a templating engine, but built in cube resources. So um, what we do, we define something, I don't see it here, yeah, that's a composite resource definition, that's a term in Crossplane. And out of that comes the CRD we want to expose. And we implement that via a composition, that's a term in cross-plane, basically a template, template for resources in Cube. So it looks like that, lots of YAML. I just give you a glimpse on that. I mean, look on cross-plane if you have, haven't seen that, pretty cool project. Basically, what we have on the left side here is this composite resource definition. It's like a CRD, very, very similar. Some other stuff inside. But basically, you see um, the name of the CRD, which we want to expose. That's the MongoDB. And on the right side, you see the templating. So basically, this is the API definition here. On the right side, it's implementation. You can imagine you have more than one implementation. You are the service provider for MongoDB in the company. You run your developer um, workloads, maybe in some software-as-a-service instance of that, because that's fine. It's quick, it's cheap, but your production workloads you want to have on your database clusters, locally, in your data center, because it's cheaper in large scale. You can do that, like you can implement the API on the left side via multiple compositions. Pretty powerful concept. Anyway, what you see here on the right side is basically a list of, um, a list of resources here at the bottom. You see the first one, is, which is the MongoDB object itself, and there are roles, role bindings, service accounts, all the things we have seen in the slide before. And out of that, if you apply the cross plane machinery, you create those objects in the cluster, and you have um, cross plane running, of course, you get a normal CRD, and kubebind will just pick it up and export that. Let's do that. So what I've done here, I have a cluster running, obviously. Um, very simple cluster. No, cube cluster. Pots. There's upbound running here. Upbound is a cross plane implementation. There's MongoDB, is the operator running. And not much more. I have a cert manager because I have a web front end here. I have DEX running for authentication. And I have my example backend running. That's it, basically. So. Let's see, so I bind this command, bind to MongoDB DE, exports. I open the URL, it's a wireless works. I was pre-authenticated because I clicked on the GitHub link before, so that's why you don't see GitHub. 
I bind done I have a CID. And this is real, it's not fake. So I can see how the connection goes. Ready is true, so no, it's not ready. Oh, it's not ready. Oh, it's ready, all right. So, and now we look on our MongoDB example, like this one, we apply it, MongoDB demo. And now something on the right side should happen. Just, I mean, you don't have to read it, just that the resource is created. Crossplane is templating now the stuff out into the cluster. Create the namespace. There's a namespace for my cluster, so here you see cluster W, H, something, um, minus default, because I'm in the default namespace here on the left, so I get the namespace here on the right, and everything is created, and eventually you see the pod running. Actually, it's already has, ha uh, has happened. So there's a demo zero pod. It's a non-HA MongoDB. It's running, and I can also check uh, status of that thing. Where is it? MongoDB, I don't have anything to do. Anyway, so status is also synced. I have my, my MongoDB. Super powerful, no code, not a single line of code. That's architecture, I'm happy to talk about it later. All right, KCP, I'm from the KCP project. Um, we have explored that a little bit in a different context. Everything you have seen here is on Cube. KCP basically is the bigger version of that. If you're MongoDB, like the company MongoDB, and you want to build that, and you have 20,000 customers, Cube is heavy. Namespaces are maybe not enough for isolation. KCP gives you the isolation and the um, efficiency in operating all of that. So there is real isolation between workspaces, and everything is very lightweight. That's why KCP plays a role here. That's just a sketch. Um, I'm happy to talk about details, just showing it very quickly here. This is the data model behind it. Um, you can see the first part of the talk under this URL if you want to share it, just do it, kubectl minus bind.io. And it's an open source project. We have a channel in, in the kube Slack, kube bind. Come to the project, we love collaboration. This is really just the start. If you're interested in this topic and you want to shape it, you want to get your features in there, join us there. Tomorrow there is a, there's another meeting. We, we have a room for birds of feather. Um, it's in the schedule, you will find it. So if you want to talk about real details, have questions about code and API, come there. We are there to talk about it. Okay, we are nearly at the end. Um, any good talk needs a task and a t-shirt to take home. I don't have t-shirts here, but we have SaaS. So we have built a SaaS service for you to use. So. I've uploaded the slides, go to the uh, SCATCOM uh, website and um, you don't have to make a photo or anything and, or remember anything. There's an API um, called t-shirt.k8cio and you can bind to it in your cluster. Before doing that, of course, install the bind command. We have a crew index, so use, a, use crew, the plugin installer to get it. And apply your t-shirt claim and when you do that, check the status, and you will see a code and a booth where to pick it up. <laughs> All right. Wow. Any, any questions? Questions? Uh, this might be a newbie question, but how would you deal with the OAuth or uh, OAuth 2 flow for the authentication in a more kind of controlled environment that a user might not be, you know? Yeah, so doing the, that? Um, the export API, actually there's a binding provider API which allows different methods to authenticate. So the provider can say, I support OAuth, I support token flow, I support those other things, password, whatever. So we are prepared for that. Yes? Uh, what about the lifecycle of the token? Does it need to run constantly? Or 
I didn't talk about that. The CID is really owned by the service provider, so you don't have to care. The service provider sees the CIDs, it, it sees the status of the CID re reflected into the system, so they can see when it's, I don't know, storage versions, for example, they see it, right? So you don't have to care. Of course, you can touch it, but then the reconciler will take it over. Yes? Okay, so is this something to merge into upstream? There's nothing forked in Kube. This is purely built on top. Whether kubectl bind becomes a thing which kubectl just ships, I don't know. I know some colleagues are here who are involved in kubectl. Talk to them. Red t-shirts here. Um, maybe it's not necessary technically. So, so, so this puts uh, the onus on the service provider now for maintaining CRDs? Yes. And that's no longer a problem for the operator? Yes, there is so no it operator. it gives it back to the yeah. people best make, I would to say make that decision? We fix the personas. Excellent. I think this was always wrong for a long time. Yes. Can the developer then consume on MongoDB? Like, is there some metadata or anything else? Oh, this is part of the um, CIDs which are exported. I mean, um, those are, so in the example, it's a claim. Okay, and a claim which, in this example, it creates a service and a secret. So you would mount the, the secret into the application, and you get a service, like a DNS name, to connect to. But this is really part of the binding, not, not of the binding, mechanism, it's part of the modeling which APIs you export. So the service provider has, has to build something which fits your use case. One more at the back. Hey, I think this was really cool. Thanks, thanks for showing us. Um, I was uh, wondering, what are the remaining CRDs that what are the remaining CRDs that are still on a cluster uh, on the client side? So my, my mission is to get clusters as empty as possible. And there's another thread around that, give people admin permissions again. Often the reason that people don't are admin in their clusters is because there's so much stuff running as well. So if we take out those operators, which are operated by, by another team, we empower the people again who own the clusters. So, of course, again, I said in the beginning, there are operators which run locally and they make total sense. I think we just, as an ecosystem, have built too many operators which are just glue. You remember this adapter chain in the beginning. We have done too much of that. Is there a question over there, sorry? Yes, one. Thank you. I saw the, the diagram and I was trying to make sense of it quickly. Over on the service provider side, you had some, uh, I think, red lines delimiting what you called cluster names. Yeah, this one maybe that's a, the heart isolation, and I had another one. Yeah, earlier. Somewhere, I don't remember. Yeah, this one? Yeah, that's there. Um, so is it the case that uh, the modeling of this is that? For each cluster in which there's a consumer, there's a Every, maybe I show the, the data structure thing. That's maybe better. And just very quickly, so people are they want to go to lunch. Anyway, so there is a cluster um, namespace, so one per cluster, and there are more namespaces like the one at the bottom here, which are per namespace on that cluster. Here we, in the example backend, we just prefix um, the. The, yeah, I mean the, the lower namespace with a cluster namespace name. But this is totally up to the implementation of the backend. Um, we use namespace isolation here because that's the only thing in Kube we have, right? Right. So, so the service provider would have to think through yes. how many clusters and namespaces yes. they would need. Yes. And of course, you can also um, imagine you use this model in Kube. You don't use KCP. KCP, of course, is much more advanced. But you can even have multiple 
service cluster, like a database team can have 17 clus uh, clusters running and this backend will point by capacity balancing in some sense, will point the, the one cluster on this, on this service cluster and the other one to another and um, distribute the load. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question regards to the, um, you can specify what RBAC permissions you, you want, you need. And it, I think it's pretty common that a service is created and you have to read or list the, the, yeah. the resource definitions and write to the status. So is there any default setting for this? That yeah, so actually RBAC well, does not do play a big specify. Airbag doesn't play a big role here. So the model about permission claims in the, in the beginning, the idea is that this agent thing, this connector, this basically offers just the view necessary. And this is not Airbag, right? It's much more powerful, or more, not powerful, let's say, more specialized for this use case of a service provider. It will just offer the view into the cluster that is necessary. It's not Airbag. But On the cluster, you can use Airbag as well to limit access, yes. But my question was, if I need this powerful mechanism, or isn't it, isn't it standard that I just want to create a service for accessing the service and uh, to read the custom resource definition and up to the, update the status sub-resource? I mean, then you need something in the cluster. The service provider has, has no access to your cluster. That's very important. Mm -hmm. It's always call out, like the connector connects to the service provider, and there's no way back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything is built in this protocol. I can talk about details later on if you like. Um, so it's, it's made in a way, it's secure, it's calling out. You can control Airbag yourself, but you have this additional mechanism to protect uh, against okay, thank what you. providers can do. So um, I, I understand the, like, the syncing of the spec and the status and the CRDs here, but I was a little confused about um, how the controller is working. So maybe can you go back to that other picture? I mean, the so, control, the so the controller, controller is on the service provider side is like looking at the resources on the service provider side. Yeah, so right? like a MongoDB operator like creates deployments and, and other resources, right, yeah. to bring up MongoDB. And yeah. so I, how, I, I was confused about how the controller that's running on the service provider side does that part. Yeah, it's, it's creating the, it's the unmodified. MongoDB resources. So it's a stock. OpenShift, uh, OpenShift uh, open source provider, like it's this community operator for MongoDB, unmodified. It will see the MongoDB community object. That's an API they create. It sees that and does its job. That's nothing special. But, but like, how does it create the MongoDB like deployments and, and um, other resources on cross, the client cluster? Cross, no, no, it's not on the client cluster. It's software as a service. It's running on the service provider cluster. It's nothing in the client cluster. Oh, one I could. See. One could think about permission claims to create a deployment. One could think about those models as well. It's much more complicated. Um, this is also possible in theory with a model, but the value proposition is about software as a service. I see, so when the client wants to like, use MongoDB, like, yeah. it just connects using the MongoDB client or yeah, via whatever, some the normal user. 27,017 or something port. Right, right, yes. okay, got it, got it, that makes sense, yeah. thanks. Have we time for one more question? And yeah, right here. So, how does uh, a credential or generate like a secret, some something that have to happen on the customers, uh, the, the consumer side cluster, in order for the application to connect to, in order to consume the service that uh, provisioned in the service provider? So, is that which which component to actually put I mean, that piece of information? Lots about this permission system you implement, like maybe there are service accounts around, right? You, maybe you, you as an admin, you bind to the API, but this application using that Argo CD, for example, use a, a token or something. This is completely part of API modeling, what you're exporting. That's not solved by QBind. We don't dictate any authentication model at all for the services we export. That's completely part of the APIs you export. If you have something like service accounts and service account objects, for example, export them, make them available to the user, and just give them a nice API to give the right identity to MongoDBs, MongoDBs. So it's API modeling, which must happen there, uh, of the service provider. 
So I, I, I can't really get that. So in terms of a MongoDB, so what is the credential actually in the end? When, when you provision the service, then how do you connect it? Do you need a piece of... Oh, so there's a secret created. Like in the beginning, I've shown with the provision claims. There's a secret in your, name, uh, in, in your, yeah, in your yeah, cluster yeah, yeah. created. So which, which component it, actually made that happen? Because that's... That service provider. The service provider will get access to sync a secret, to create a secret on your site. But yeah. just this one secret of a special name, nothing else. That happens on the client, I mean, the consumer side mm -hmm. cluster, mm -hmm. right? So the connector does that, or? The connector just syncs. It will make sure that the secret the provider has created gets into the oh, consumer cluster. Okay. So That's the, the connector. So the connector syncs yes. the secret over yes. from yes. the service provider yes. into the consumer side. Yes, and the connector is open source, vendor neutral. Everybody can see what it does, right? That's powerful. You can, it's a community co uh, component. Everybody can review and audit and everything. So it's safe, like the secret really lands on your site and it's safe. It cannot do anything else than creating the secret. Okay, okay. got it. All right, thank you. Time for lunch.